If you're struggling in the situational judgment subtest and you always seem to be one or two questions off from the correct answer, this is the video for you because I'll be showing you the ethical skills that you need to get into medical school. My name's Emil and I scored in the 99th percentile on the UCAT in 2020. And this video is the fifth video in my UCAT crash course sponsored by MedEntry. In this video, I'll give you an overview of the subtest, share my general strategy, my tips and tricks, and finally go through some questions live on camera. The first thing you need to know about the situational judgment subtest is that it is marked separately from all of the other subtests in the UCAT. The other subtests are added up to create your cognitive score, which is what people usually say is their general score in the UCAT, and it's what you get a percentile number from. On the other hand, the situational judgment subtest is usually treated separately, and you can either get a banding from one to four, which indicates what quartile of the cohort you're in, or you can just get a number out of 900. Different universities tend to treat the situational judgment subtest differently. So some universities won't use it at all and will only use the first four subtests, your cognitive score. Other universities will have a minimum requirement for your situational judgment score, for example, 90th percentile. And then other universities will include your situational judgment score with your cognitive score and create some sort of ranking based on that. At the end of the day, this means that the situational judgment subtest is actually important because you could have the same cognitive score as someone else and it might end up being your situational judgment score that helps you get a higher rank than that person. In this subtest, you have 69 questions to answer in 26 minutes, but usually the questions come in sets of three or four based on a passage that contains some sort of ethical scenario for you to consider. Personally, I don't think time is a huge issue in this subtest and the questions can come in forms of appropriateness questions, importance questions, or drag and drop questions of either type. The other thing to know about this subtest is that partial marks are given. What this means is if you choose the correct side, for example, appropriate or inappropriate, but you don't get the exact answer, you can still get a half mark for the question. This is because there's often a lot of room for debate in ethical scenarios, and as a result, the markers are fairly generous. Overall, this subtest tests your ability to have good ethical considerations and also how well you can prioritize issues in a scenario. So now moving on to my general strategy for the subtest, the first thing that I do is usually read the stimulus very carefully to understand understand the key issues. For example, a pretty common issue that can come up in scenarios are a breach of patient confidentiality where an important document containing patient information is lost or stolen. In this case, I try to identify what the separate issues are in this scenario. The first might be that the patient's confidentiality has been breached, and then secondly, it might be that there was a situation in which the patient confidentiality could have been breached in the first place. In general, it's quite nice to ask yourself what has gone wrong in the situation, but then also follow that up with how has that gone wrong and why has that gone wrong. After you identify the issues, try to order those issues in terms of importance. Continuing from the example of patient confidentiality before, in general, the patient almost always comes first in these situations. In most situations, patient safety is going to be the most important thing, but after that, it's up to you to determine what things are relevant and important to the situation. The next thing that I like to do is think about the best and worst case scenario that could occur. I find this helpful in appropriateness questions in particular, because often there can be actions that might be all right, but there might be a way better action that therefore can color the way you see the action that's given in the question. Thinking about the best and worst case scenarios can then therefore give you a more nuanced understanding of the question and help you get a right answer. The next thing that I do is I try to evaluate how likely I think certain probabilities are to occur and how likely things are to be important. This is almost the final step, but using this is when I then go on to picking a side first. Usually what I like to do is eliminate options. So what I'll do is I'll pick a side whether I think it's appropriate or not appropriate or important or not important in general. Then I know that my answer options are going to be between A and B or between C and D, and then it becomes a lot easier for me to choose whether something is good or not. After this, it's a matter of building up your ethical compass over time and figuring out what you think the right answer is going to be. So moving on to my tips for the subtest, the first piece of advice I have is to learn the basic principles of medical ethics. There are generally five main things here, autonomy, 
beneficence, non-maleficence, justice, and confidentiality that are important to understand in almost all situations that involve patients. What I'd recommend is searching these terms up in your own time to understand what they mean and how they actually influence how you would answer certain scenarios. Having a strong grasp of these terms is really good for this subtest because it gives you a nice ethical framework to work from when you're answering these questions. The second tip I have is to understand mitigating factors. Mitigating factors are essentially factors that can make a situation less good or bad. For example, an appropriateness question might give you an action that's really bad, but then there's one slight positive of that action, and that would be a mitigating factor that would make the answer C, but not D. When you're answering questions, it's nice to think about these factors and how they might influence the answer, because often that's the reason why an answer is not A and D, because of a mitigating factor. My third tip is to familiarize yourself with the common scenarios that come up in the subtest. These are often things like maintaining trust, maintaining confidentiality, uh, being a good medical student, knowing your role, maintaining trust and teamwork. After you familiarize yourself with this, I would make a list of scenarios that you see very commonly. And what I would do is I would compare different passages and different questions to see what was similar and different about them so that you can better understand nuance between questions. Read through the explanation that are given for these questions on sites like MedEntry and try to understand the logic that leads to the ethical considerations in a scenario. Finally, one of the best things you can do is thoughtful practice on scenarios, focusing on those areas of weakness that you have and also focusing on having a system for answering these questions and using that every time. Before I move on to answering some questions myself, I'd like to thank MedEntry for sponsoring this series. MedEntry is the UCAT preparation platform that I used when I was preparing for my UCAT, and I find that they have questions that are most similar to the actual test. They've just launched their new LMS platform, which has an interactive curriculum, skills trainers, thousands of practice questions and over 20 mock exams for you to use to practice. So sign up using the link in the description box down below to get 15% off their online or platinum packages. Okay, so you guys know the drill. I've got the meta entry question bank up on the screen here. And the first question type that we'll go over are these appropriateness questions. So the first thing that I will do is I will read through this scenario and try to understand what the issues are in the situation. So we see a Dr. Bennett, a junior doctor, is being shadowed by two medical students, um, a patient with severe autism. And then at one point in the consultation, the, um, the patient begins rock rocking back and forth and moaning loudly. Then as the doctor is helping to calm down, the medical students are laughing um, while watching the patient. Then the patient doesn't notice, but, and Dr. Bennett has not previously observed the students behaving unprofessionally. So I think the main obvious issue in the scenario is that the medical students are laughing at this patient with severe autism, which is obviously very unprofessional and could be considered really rude to the patient. However, we might also wanna think about the other possible issues that might be in this situation. So one possible other issue might be the patient's safety and how the patient feels about this whole situation. The scenario does say that the patient doesn't notice, but it is possible that they might have noticed without the doctor realizing that they have noticed. The other issue that I might think of in this situation might be the issue of how Dr. Bennett will actually address this issue with the medical students and how he'll reprimand them or teach them about what is important in these situations. So with the first question, whether it's appropriate to reprimand this medical student in Brett's presence, I think this is definitely on the inappropriate side. Although it addresses whether the, the idea of the medical students laughing while watching Brett, it is important to consider the second issue, which is Brett and Brett's feelings. I think the issue that could occur is that Brett might feel really uncomfortable if the doctor was to reprimand the medical students in his presence. And as a result, I think this would probably be inappropriate um, the reason why I don't think it's very inappropriate is because it does actually address the issue of the medical students laughing while watching the patient. So here with the second question about whether it's appropriate for Dr. Bennett to closely observe the medical students to see if they demonstrate unprofessional behavior in the future, immediately I'm thinking that this is again on the C or D side because it doesn't do anything to address the immediate situation. Here there might be a mitigating factor, which is that this is actually something that is good but I think here, doing a way up of what's important in the situation, I think it's really important that the medical students are reprimanded for this because they have done something that is clearly very, very unprofessional. But I think because there is a mitigating factor, again, it's probably likely to be C. 
So here with the third question, do not take any action as Brett does not appear to have noticed the medical student's behavior. Immediately, I'm thinking that this is D. Just because the patient doesn't notice that the students are being unprofessional, doesn't mean there's nothing wrong with their unprofessionalism. The doctor should 100% do something about this. Now with this question, after Brett has left, inform the students that their behavior has no place in the medical field. I think immediately this is probably A, because there's no real drawback to him doing this. Firstly, it's after the patient has left, so the patient won't feel uncomfortable about the situation. Then it also immediately addresses the issue of the student's unprofessional behavior and tells them that it's not appropriate. So with the next question, report the medical student's behavior to the academic supervisor. I think this one is pretty tricky because it's, it is taking some action to reprimand the students and inform them that their behavior is wrong. However, it doesn't do much in the immediate circumstance and it also doesn't might be too strong of a punishment for whatever just happened. So I think because it addresses the student's behavior, I think it's on the side of A or B, but then because there's a mitigating factor of the fact that it might be too strong or it might not be immediate feedback to the students and informing them of what they've done wrong, I think the answer is probably B. So let's just submit our answers and see how we went on these questions. So as you can see, we've gotten almost all of those questions right. If we have a look at why I got the second question wrong, we'll see that the answer was actually D. It was a very inappropriate thing to do. If we have a look at why the answer to this question was D, we'll see that the answer that they've given is because he's not taking any immediate action in a situation where their behavior is disrespectful and inappropriate. So it's nice to understand here that the reason I've made this mistake is because I didn't fully understand that the medical student's behavior was so bad that it had to warrant immediate action and not doing that would be very, very inappropriate. As you can see though, we did get partial marks for this question, but next time I'll know that when a breach of confidentiality or professionalism is so bad that it's really important to take immediate action 100% of the time. Okay, so now we'll look at the second question type in the situational judgment subtest, which are these importance questions. So reading this scenario, we see Vincent, a student, is required to attend weekly tutorials relating to professionalism and self-care. Um, the tutorials are on a Friday afternoon and he feels like they're not particularly useful. He has a friend's wedding uh, the coming weekend, which is taking place in a regional town, and he hopes to leave early on Friday afternoon to attend a pre-wedding social event. The wedding takes place on Saturday afternoon, and he's deciding whether to leave early on Friday, which resu would result in him missing the tutorial. So the main issue that we see in this scenario is that Vincent is struggling to balance his social life and his academic life. So usually in these scenarios, it's very important to understand that a student's main priority should be their studies. And as a result, they shouldn't be compromising their studies and learning for social events. The other issue we see is that Vincent hasn't really thought about telling the tutor anything about this or doing anything to inform the university that he might miss it. So when we look at the first question, that if Vincent were to attend the tutorial, he would miss the pre-wedding social event. Because it's so much more important for students to follow their academic studies, I think this is definitely on the side of not important. Because though, I think that um, he would miss his pre-wedding event and that might be slightly important to him. This might be C. I think it's pretty hard to tell whether it's C or D, but I think because he's making such a big breach of what he's supposed to do as part of his learning, I think it's most likely going to be D because it's not that important that he misses the pre-wedding event, especially if the wedding is actually taking place on a Saturday afternoon. So second question, that he feels the tutorial is not useful to this, his learning. This I think immediately is probably going to be D. Um, it doesn't actually matter that Vincent thinks that this tutorial is not useful to his learning. If the medical school has put that in place and they've put it in place as part of their curriculum, it definitely probably is important, even if Vic Vincent doesn't actually realize it. So because of that, I'm thinking that the answer is gonna be D. With the next question that Vincent is required to attend a minimum of 80% of the tutorials to pass the year, I think this is going to be on the important side because it's important for Vincent to consider his academic studies as a student, and it's important for him to meet all the criteria required for him to pass. So I don't think there's any reason um, as why this would not be very important for him to consider. So here we've got another scenario. Dr. Chen is a junior doctor working in general practice, seeing an elderly patient for a rash um, who lives in a nursing home. After examining, uh, he diagnosed scabies, which is a contagious infection. Uh, he provides um, the nursing staff at the resident with instructions on how to treat the infection, reviews the following week and finds it to be no better. Then when he investigates, he realizes the treatment regime 
um, was not followed correctly. So here the issue is, is that the rash is contagious, the patient might be unwell, and because the rash is contagious, it might have spread to other people in the nursing home. So here we see, oh, the question is that the rash is contagious, so this is definitely gonna be A, very important. There's no reason why you wouldn't worry about this in this situation. Second question, the reason as to why the instructions were not followed. Again, this is definitely very important because it's important for the doctor to understand what might be wrong with the treatment regime or why there was an issue with following it in the first place. So we'll have a look at the answers to these questions and see how we did. So as you can see, we got all of those questions right, which is great to see. Hopefully you have a better idea of how to tackle this situational judgment subtest. And if you enjoy this video, check out my abstract reasoning guide here and my playlist with all of my UCAT videos here.